Welcome. Listen, it's a, uh, a pleasure always to be able to present to you guys, talk to you, look at things in the Bible together. Um, and today we're continuing where we left off last week. Last week is hard for me to even imagine that last week was Mother's Day. This week has been so busy and has, so much has happened. And you know, I, we had a, a big three-day conference with all the church ministers this last week and um, not a refreshing fun time. It was a, a lot of hard work. And so coming out of that, it just seems like about a month ago we were in church, uh, but it was just a week ago. And so you may not remember what we were talking about last week, because I don't, and I did it. All right, so last week on Mother's Day, we talked about how God intentionally, purposefully chooses to measure our worth and our value through a very different set of standards than we see in the world around us, All right? Whether that's yeah, well, in every part of the way that you identify yourself, when you're looking, what, what is my value? What is my worth? And if you were looking out into what the world says about what makes a person valuable and worthy and important, and then you go to Scripture and you begin to hear the heart of God, you begin to see that these two things are very different, that God measures us in a very different way than we measure each other, and that we are measured by the people around us in the world. And so, We've been kind of talking about, beginning last week, looking at how God reverses those values, and we're going to continue in that discussion today. And to get us in the right frame of mind, to get our hearts in the right spot, get us thinking about the right thing, I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question. Now, a rhetorical question is a weird way to say that, because rhetoric is what we do when we speak out loud, but when we say a rhetorical question, it's don't speak out loud, right? When I say it's a rhetorical question, that's in your brain, you can think the answer, but if you say it out loud, sometimes it's very embarrassing for you and the people around you. Uh, so in this particular instance, I'm asking you the question, what do you think of when you hear the word inadequate? All right? When you think about the concept of something being inadequate. Now, not who do you think about, because that's rude. All right? uh, that's, don't do that. What ideas, all right? what images pop into your mind, what are the things that you think of? And I, I've been looking at this this week, looking for the exception to the rule, and I can't really come up with one because the rule seems to be that every time I think of the word inadequate, it's something negative, uh, something missing, something less than, something that's lacking, something that doesn't measure up, something that's less valuable. I can't think of a way, and I know one of you is smarter than me, you'll come up to me afterwards and say, here's the example, and I'll thank you for that, that'll be excellent. You can also put it on a contact card. If you do, make sure you put your name on it. All right, anonymous contact cards go out the window, even the positive ones. Uh, listen, so when I think about inadequacy, when I think about the word inadequate, when I think about what does it mean, it's not good, right? Inadequate sleep, is that good for anyone? No, it's not good for you or the people that you love. Inadequate coffee in my house, bad news. Uh, inadequate strength, inadequate skills, inadequate money. Like there's, there's really not much of an example I can give you that's inadequate, what, pain? I mean, that means you have some, so I don't really like that one either. All right, so when we think about this idea of inadequacy, we don't like it, we know it's a bad thing, and we especially don't like it when people around us that we love feel inadequate. Okay, you know that. You've got someone in your life that you love, and when they're struggling to feel like they are worthy, when they feel like they measure up, that they have uh, done enough in enough people's eyes to be of value to the world or to themselves or to their families, when you're with someone that is struggling with seeing their value and their worth, I hope that your heart breaks for them, right? I hope that you see when they're struggling with inadequacy, I hope you have that sense of longing to correct that and make it better for them and help them see their value and worth. And the same goes for yourself. And so one of the biggest sources of inadequacy that we struggle with, one of the reasons we feel this is because of another word that often is not great, which is the word comparison. Uh, we have a problem as a human being, as, as a race of people, as a species. We constantly compare ourselves to everyone around us. And we compare everyone around us to each other. And we compare all, everyone at all levels in all ways. And we use all of that comparison to measure our own value and worth. So we're going to be looking at this idea. What does this mean for us to, to 
speak about the problems that come along with comparison. And one of the ways we're gonna look at that this morning is through the words, through the message that the Holy Spirit gave the Apostle Paul, who then turned and gave those words to the church. And the reason he gives this particular teaching that we're gonna be looking at first, we're gonna look at two messages from the Apostle Paul this morning that deal with the struggle of comparison and how comparing ourselves to others to determine our worth and our value, especially in God's eyes. When you wanna know, well, where do you stand with God? And if your first response, second response is to look at other people and to see, well, where am I in relation to those folks? That comparison almost always leads us down a dark and negative road. And you're gonna see that. And the Apostle Paul has got some words to say to us about that. So we're gonna start in the book of Galatians. We're gonna look at Galatians chapter six, verses one to six. Okay, so if you wanna go there, you can. You can always write this down, take a picture, whatever, come back to it later, study it for yourself. So I'm I'm giving you this teaching in the full context, not just picking out the little piece of it. So this is uh, Galatians six, starting in verse one. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin or trapped in a sin, you who live by the spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. One of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, verse six. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. I just wanna make sure you got the whole context. I don't wanna be accused of of cutting it off too early. Uh, Okay, so what are we talking about here? The first part of this teaching clearly is talking to the family of faith, to the church the followers of Jesus, and when one of us is struggling in sin, when we fall flat on our face, when we mess up, we fail. Remember, sin is not an accident, it's not a mistake. You don't trip and fall into sin, it's a willful decision to choose your will over God's will. You know what's right and wrong, you choose the wrong. At least that's how I understand sin. And for me, it's, it's a lot, there's temptation to do that, to make myself the ruler of my own life, to follow my own will over God's will everywhere I look. Okay, but imagine the situation he's talking about. There is someone who has given in to that temptation. They are struggling. They have fallen flat. He says that it is not the church's job to stand over them in shame and condemnation. It is the church's job to help them, right? To be there for them. It says if you're struggling, if you're caught, you know, that they should seek to be restored gently. You know, to work with someone, to come alongside them and to help them, not to stand over them and yell, repent and shame, you loser. If that's your approach, stop it. Okay, that's not what this is about. And it says that basically, you know, our job here is pretty simple. The first thing you might need to do might be pretty easy, which is just listen. Listen to the other person, hear what they have, listen to their struggle, listen to what they've been through. Perhaps that's really all that they needed was some other believer in Jesus Christ to sit down with them over coffee to hear what they've been through and to just allow them to get it out. Because often, it happens to me all the time, someone says, oh, pastor, oh, pastor, I really need to come talk to you. And I just sit and they just tell me everything that's gone wrong in their life. And they're like, yep, I see the answer. And they up and leave. And I'm just thinking, you, you, I you literally could have just talked to the wall. All right, you just needed to get it out. You know, it's often that's all that you need. That's really because the Holy Spirit convicts you, shows you what you need to be doing. You're reminded of what's real, what's right. You know what God says and you move on. All right, and maybe that's all it takes to, to restore someone gently. But there are other times uh, where restoration takes a lot more. You have to get a lot more involved. You've got to get, get your hands dirty. You've got to walk with somebody for a long, a long road. And in that situation, the Apostle Paul is making sure that the church understands that we must also protect ourselves that we don't fall into the same sin. So that we don't struggle alongside that person in our our attempt to understand and to let them know that we care. You know what that looks like? You know, somebody is struggling with pornography and so you say, well, 
You don't, you don't come along and say, well, show me what you've been looking at. Okay. All right, I'm just making sure you understand that. You might think, well, that's dumb. Uh-huh. Yeah, we, so are we, every one of us. Okay, so that's one, one big part of this teaching, but the other part is very specific. Paul names the sin that you need to avoid. You're like, I didn't remember that. Yeah, it's right there. Look at verses three and five again, all right? Three to five. Galatians six, verses three to five says this. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. When we compare ourselves to other people in life, when we compare ourselves to those around us who are walking with us, when we, when we make that comparison, we open the door for sin in our lives. How does that work? Well, to me, it looks like it happens in two different ways. One, you look at the outward actions of someone else, right? You, do, you can't see what's in their heart. You don't know what they're really thinking, what they're struggling, what their faith looks like. And so all that you can do is judge them by their fruits, right? Look at what's coming out of their life. And so when you're, strugg- when you're walking with that person who is struggling and you are comparing yourself to them, often you can fall into the sin of feeling like you are superior to them. Saying, man, look at this guy. Oh, what a loser. I mean, come on, man, get your act together. It's not that hard, just stop, right? Just quit already, just walk away from it. It's not that difficult. Look at me, I can do it. Okay, that, that's a, a slippery slope that leads you to a place of superiority, arrogance, and pride, which, by the way, are all sin, right? These are things when you stand over someone else in judgment, and pretend to be God in their life, that's not a good thing. The other thing that we struggle with when we walk with somebody who has fallen flat and we begin to compare ourselves to them is that we can actually go away feeling extremely inadequate. You can go away feeling worse than they are. How does that happen? It happens to me all the time. You know, I'll get a call from somebody that's like, we re- I need to have a real conversation. This is really serious. And I go in expecting the worst, right? I always believe that the secret to happiness is lower all of your expectations, all right? So if you go in expecting the absolute worst thing and it turns out that they're struggling because they're missing their quiet times because their babies are crying, you walk away going like, geez, man, if you're struggling with that, I have no hope, (laughs) right? If that is something that is causing you real distress, what's wrong with me? Like, why can't I get my act together? I wish I had that problem. I wish it was just something so small in my life. I'm a total disaster. I'm I'm insignificant, and I I can't, I'll never measure up. So it seems to me that comparison is not a good thing for us. That's why we're taught to not do this with each other, but instead to, if you want to do some judging, judge yourself. All right, if you're feeling a real itch to go out and to name sin in someone else's life, start with your own, right? And I bet you'll, uh, you'll have plenty to do. You won't have much free time after you start that project. So comparison leads us to suffer in at least two ways. One is pride, arrogance, and superiority, or perhaps an, a growing sense of inadequacy. We feel less than. And so the Apostle Paul is teaching us about this, and then the next thing he has to say we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. So Paul says this to the church, again, led by the Spirit, speaking to the church about an important thing that we need to hear. Verse 12, he says, "Do uh, we do not dare classify ourselves, all right? We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. Now, I get this verse, all right? This is one of those tricky ones that you actually have to read the words. Let's start over. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. All right, that's a nice way to say it. What is he saying here? He's saying... And I get it, it's, it's a bit hard 
to, to grasp, but if you actually listen and pay attention to it, I think there is a truth that you need to hear because he's saying that there are a lot of people, and unfortunately they're in the church, who feel like they've got it figured out. And, and their view of God, their view of life, their view of money and sin and righteousness, their view of everything is also God's view. I'm not gonna ask you if you know anybody like that because we just talked about superiority and judgment. But these are people who look into the mirror and they feel like everyone should look like them, right? That they are the standard. They compare themselves, not by Christ, not by what God's word says, but by themselves. Well, I feel like this is right. This looks right to me, therefore it must be right because I feel it's right. And then you stand again in judgment over others and you compare yourself to others and you go away missing everything that the Holy Spirit has to teach you in terms of righteousness, obedience, sin, and shame. So the Apostle Paul is challenging the church to not seek out this, this sin of comparison. Right? The real point that he's making here is that this is not how God views us. Did you know this? God does not compare you to you. He doesn't compare you to me or me to you. That's not how God determines our value. Did you know that the Lord does not have a ranking of all the humans on the planet, one to seven point whatever billion, and wherever you are in the ranking order? That's not how God thinks of us. And he says that over and over and over. But yet we are the ones that do the comparisons. We fall into that trap, and because we think that God is like us, we assume that God must be comparing us because that's how we would be if we were God. Or at least that's how I would be. Right? If I were ranking the world, I certainly know who's at the bottom. Right? If I were the one in charge, I, I know who I'd put at the top. And I'm, I'm open for bribes. <laughs> Which is great that I'm not God. Hey, listen, the point is, is important here, and I think I want to I wanna make sure that we grasp this. And so we're going to be looking at another example. Okay, so those two were given to us by the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit, working through Paul, giving these letters to the church. Next, we're going to hear about how God sent one of his prophets named Samuel. Okay, this is found in Samuel chapter, uh, chapter 16. That God sent Samuel, one of his prophets, to go and do a big job for the Lord. He'd already done it once, which was to go out and anoint the king over Israel. So at that time, prior to the first anointing of King Saul, there was no king in Israel. They were supposed to be seeking the Lord for direction, but people being people would rather follow another person than follow God. So they, they begged the Lord for a king. He gave them Saul, and they got what they asked for. All right, and so Saul's biggest problem as king was, well, he was rebellious to the Lord and his heart was wrong. He, he didn't follow God. He didn't follow the directions that God had given him as king. And so the Lord was ready to move on from Saul, but he wasn't going to choose Jonathan, Saul's son, as would happen in most places. The Lord said, no, I'm going to seek out a different kind of person. You wanted, you wanted someone who had the right outward appearance because Saul had the right outward appearance as king. The people wanted someone who was tall and strong and handsome, someone who looked royal and regal. And so the Lord said, fine, you get what you want and you reap the results. And then the Lord said, it's time for us to move on from the outward appearance and I'm gonna show you what matters most. And so the Lord sent Samuel in to anoint the next king over Israel by a different set of standards. And so Samuel goes into the town of Bethlehem. You ever heard of that place? Yeah, interesting things happen there. And there was a man there by the name of Jesse. And Jesse had a few kids. He had eight sons. That's nuts. <laughs> mm, you have to live on a farm. Like, if that's, what, if that's your interest, get some open land and lots of animals. Uh, so he had eight, eight sons. And so God had told Samuel, he's a prophet, and he came to him and said, the Lord has chosen your family, and he's going to choose one of your sons. He's going to anoint one of your sons as the next king over Israel. Let's line them up. And so Jesse goes and rounds up the ones that he wants to line up, and he lines them up. 
And that's where we're going to pick up this story, okay? So let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6. It says this. It says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward experience, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shemas pass by and Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? Well, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day, from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. So the last time that the Lord anointed a king over Israel, he listened to what the people wanted. The people wanted someone who looked like a king outwardly. He had the right appearance. He had, he had the right style. Everything about him looked like a, a king should look. Except for one big problem. His heart was wrong. He didn't seek the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind, all of his strength. He, he didn't do the thing that God had asked of him. And so this time, the Lord's doing something different. He chooses David, not because he's the strongest, not because he's the best, not because he's the most accomplished, but because of his heart, because of who he is in his character. You hear the reversal of values again in verse 7. Look at verse 7 again, okay? It says, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. Okay, hear that. The Lord doesn't look at the things that people look at. Those things that we measure, when we look at someone's appearance, you look at their style, you look at their size, you look at their body, you look at their uh, signs of wealth or significance or importance, those things crumble. They turn to dust. That beautiful body can be broken. Things happen, people age, everything can go wrong. The things that we look at to determine value and worth, it says that the Lord does not look at those things. It says people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. David wasn't even considered worthy of in making the lineup. Right, Jesse didn't even look at him and think he's worthy of getting out of the field. I mean. Surely God will take one of these other boys of mine because they're older, stronger, better. David is inadequate. There is no way that God would choose this inadequate youngest son of mine when I have better selections in front of you. He just didn't even consider it. Right? Because people are looking at the outside things but it says that the Lord does not measure, doesn't value us in the same way that the world does. Not even your own father. All right, think about that. David's own dad rejected him. Didn't consider him worthy. But God did. Right? God looks past those things. He looks past the, the measurements that we use to decide, is this, is this kid good enough for my kid? Is this person good enough to be in my, in my employment? Is this the right spouse for me? Well, look at them, I don't know. I mean, they're not perfect. They, it's like in a Seinfeld episode, right? There's always some flaw, and that's humanity. There's always gonna be flaws, there's always things that are shortcomings, but God looks past all of those things. He looks at, at us stripped of our titles, he looks at us without our bank accounts, without our cars, without our clothes, without our style. And God sees who you are. That's what he values. That's a pretty awesome thing. Jesus taught this many different ways. Okay, our last passage we're gonna look at today is a parable that Jesus gave us. 
that speaks clearly, very clearly, to the way that God reverses what we consider to be a value in the world. I want you to hear this parable. If you've been here before, you've heard this. I know it. Uh, but I, I love it so much. It's so powerful. It's so good. So let's look at Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. It says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. The parable is given to whom? It says at the beginning, it's given to those who have confidence in themselves before the Lord. People who see their behavior, see their actions, they see their value, and they see that they are able to stand before God in their own strength and their own goodness. They look at the people around them and they know God likes me best. Right? That's, those are the people that are given this parable. And to this parable, right, we are we are seeing the dangers of comparison. Okay, so the first person that you meet is the Pharisee, a religious man. All right, in that day, I would be a Pharisee. Not in my heart, but that would be my job. I'm a preacher, teacher, taker of the word, expounder of things, you know, a reminder of the things that God has said. That's their job, that's what they did. Instead of listening to what the word said, he probably taught it without actually applying it, that happens. And here we see in the situation that he is in a time of, of prayer, and this is a specific kind of prayer. Right? Maybe not a kind of prayer you're gonna find uh, in the Bible as an, something you're encouraged to do, but this is a prayer of comparison. This is probably not one of those in those prayer books that if you go find one at Kurong, you're probably not gonna find the prayer of comparison. Uh, but this was one that he was in. Standing before God, in conversation with God, comparing yourself to other people. Did it, did it help him worship better? Did it bring him closer in his relationship to the Lord? No, it brought him into sin. Right? It brought him into a place where it exposes his heart and shows the Lord and everybody around him that he is not walking with God. How do you know he's not walking with God? Well, because his heart doesn't resemble the heart of God. He's standing in judgment of others, comparing himself to them. And what he's doing is what Paul asked the church not to do. He says, listen, don't look at the people around you and assume that they should look like you. Don't look around and think, well, you're not doing it the way I say or the way I think, therefore you're wrong. That's what this man was doing. He was looking at the people around him and thinking, they're not, I'm doing it right. They should be doing it like me. And then Jesus gives us the other character in this parable, you hear about him in verse 13. It says, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now remember, this is a parable. These are not real people. Okay, so before you jump in and start uh, thinking that these are real life folks, these were meant to be polar opposites. And Jesus tells us that the person in the the parable, whose heart is right, is a villain. You know, tax collectors, all through, all, well, all through human history, have been seen as villains. I had to do my U.S. taxes last night. Those villains. <laughs> all right? I don't even know who is on the other side, but I know that they're full of evil. <laughs> you know, so the tax collector, the bad guy in this story, is the one who Jesus lifts up and says, it was this one who humbled himself before the Lord. He didn't compare himself to other people. He didn't look around to measure his worth and value by 
whether or not he was doing something better than the next person. Instead, it says he wouldn't even look to heaven. He wouldn't, he wouldn't do that. He didn't have any arrogance in his heart, but he beat his, his chest and he acknowledged his own sin, his own need for God's mercy and grace in his life. Not comparing himself to others, but dealing with his own mess, which is exactly what we were taught to do in Galatians chapter one, uh, 6, 1 to 6. So the point here that I want you to hear for today, when we talk about how does God value you, one of the things I really want you to walk away with, if you don't remember anything else I have to say, I hope this sticks with you. I want you to know that God does not measure you against the other people around you. Okay? If, if that's the only thing that you walk away with today, it will save you from a million different negative roads that lead to a place of sin. You won't find yourself in a place of superiority, and you won't find yourself feeling inadequate when you compare yourself to the people around you. Because in God's eyes, you're a child of the living God by the work of Jesus Christ. All of your good and all of your evil has been nailed to the cross with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ in and through me. The life I live, I live by the grace of God in this body. One day I will be freed from this world of sin and I'll be freed from this body, I'll be freed from the struggle that I'm in, but until that day, I walk by his pleasure. Does that mean I'm always pleasing to the Lord? No, not at all. But that means that those things that I am beating myself up for and I'm holding myself uh, as, as a shameful character for have all been nailed to the cross. They are all included in the work of Christ and I am a new child in the eyes of God. God does not compare you to me or, or me to you. In his eyes, we are all his children, beloved, equally. Let's pray about it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that gift that we just said. We thank you that in your word, in your actions, and in your resurrection, in all of the things you have done, Lord Jesus, you have taught us it's not about us. Lord, it's not about our strength, about our perfection, but Lord, it's about what you have done for us. It is about your love for us. Lord, you didn't give us a, a list of jobs to do to earn your love. You didn't give us a set of commands that have to be followed in order to find salvation. Lord, what you called us to was to a life of humility, faith, to trust in you. Lord, to place our concerns in your hands, to place our failure on the cross, Lord, to acknowledge that your love for us is greater than our sin. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for that gift. It is an incredible blessing to us. Lord, we ask that that blessing extend as we enter this time of reflection and worship together. Amen.